Okay. Peace. <laughs> Is this thing on? Okay, cool. All right, we're What's here. Up? We're in this living room, this simulated living room situation. I like this. Um, hi, everyone. How's everybody doing? <laughs> I'm so excited to be in conversation with you and to just talk about music and uh, music we love, your own music, your musical journey. Um, so we're here, we've got this great setup. We have some records that we're gonna just chat about. Um, so while I'm queuing up the very first record, how about you introduce yourself, okay. um, and then I'll jump in and introduce myself afterwards. Awesome, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Theo Croker. I'm a musician, trumpet player. I've started rapping recently. Uh, I compose, I produce, all of those things, all of the elements that go into playing music. The trumpet is actually the easy part for me. And uh, but yeah, I'm excited to be at the Elb Philharmonic. I can tell you that. I love this place. <laughs> is that Alice Coltrane? Yes, it is. Um, oh, and I think I'm supposed to share the record on the, we have folks who are tuning in. So let me do the honors. Mm. And we are listening to the very first track, Journey in Sachi Dananda. Um, so for all of you who don't know who I am, my name is e Dr. Inango Lumumba Kasango. I'm a producer, I'm a rapper, I'm a professor at Brown University in the music department, and I'm very excited to hear about this rap situation that you just discussed. <laughs> I would love we to talk more that. about yeah. it. <laughs> um, but first, let's, let's start, let's cue this up and, and have our first moment. Wow. That's a vibe, Doc. Yeah, my goodness. So hopefully you all, you, you kind of ushered in the, the song by saying it's a journey. And indeed, I really feel like I just kind of was like astral projecting yeah. and <laughs> observing the space and observing myself. Um, so yeah, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about like your responses, your bodily responses to that, like the, the somatic register that it speaks to, because I think that's, you know, something that we can forget when we're talking about music and what it means and is really what's happening on a bodily level as we're absorbing it. And I think as a, as a, a you know, such a, a gifted musician, I feel like you're thinking on the body level in a way that folks might not necessarily have access to all the time. So yeah, if you could yeah. just talk about how this makes you feel in your body, that would be great, a great place to start, I think. Um, you know, when I, when I listen to music, especially music like this, uh, I'm trying to do everything I can to shut off my theoretical mind. Mm. Like I can hear that it's in E minor. I can hear that they're going between E minor and A minor. And mm. and the fact that it's so simple and, and it's an open string. E is an open string. So it's a very powerful resonance with the mm. bass and everything. And once my mind gets past all of that, I just kind of let go. And uh, for this specific album, which is a, a favorite, um, I feel a real guttural reaction, like it's mm. in my heart. Mm. You know, it's in my it's in my 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 sacral chakras, and it's coming up from the root, and it's just kind of making me feel warm and fuzzy and safe. Yeah. And I really feel like I am astral projecting when mm -hmm. I listen to anything Alice Coltrane does, mm -hmm. which I think is her purpose. <laughs> I think yeah. she does that on on yeah. purpose. Um, and to me, she's as, you know, she's as prolific as, as John Coltrane, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, even even more so because she had a, had a longer life mm -hmm. and had much more to explore. And, um, you know, it's very it's a very spiritual reaction happening. Like I feel the chemistry yeah. in my body and my DNA reacting to what I'm hearing. Yes. Which I don't get that with all kind of music. Um, that's that's where I, that's where it starts actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I I appreciate so much the way that you broke that down. That there's almost this kind of like theoretical filter through yeah. which you observe and engage with music, <laughs> and it's actually the the you know the work of a true kind of magician genius to break that down to actually disable you from in interfacing with that part of yourself, yeah, you, right? You, you have to shut it you have to shut it off. I mean, in all contexts, even when I perform later, I'm mm. gonna shut that off. But it's it's the initial thing that's there. It's like, okay, I hear the key center, I hear 
the changes. I hear how, I don't know what instrument that is. Maybe it's a sitar. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I hear how the sitar is doing one, five, one, sometimes a dominant seven, and how that's all resonating and ringing. And mm. I hear how the drummer and bass player are locking up, with, but still extremely open. Yeah. You know, and it's just it just it just feels like it can go anywhere. Mm. But it also feels like they're not forcing it to go anywhere. Wow. Like I, f- I feel like that song could have went on for 30 more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I would not have been bothered by it yeah. <laughs> at all. That's such a great way to put it. And we'll we'll move on from the song in a moment. But I, I do want to sit in this for a moment just because you're you're doing such a. Um, a great job of unpacking how you approach this this artist and this kind of artistry um, in the somatic register. And you, you use the word um, spiritual, which I think is really important for talking about yeah. Alice Coltrane, right? Because this, this record emerges as she's moving in this spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, her, her husband has passed and she's trying to figure out who she is as an artist and what the next steps are. Right. Um, and she starts seeking kind of Hindu guidance, right? She like actually is making a kind of spiritual conversion and the music is a reflection of that, right? Journey in Sachidananda is like, is so encapsulating of her actual like life spiritual journey. Um, so I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about like your... Um, like spiritual identity and how that shows up in your work or how maybe it doesn't show sure. up in your work. But yeah, I wanted to hear about the spirit. Um, you know, I think it goes back to when I, I really, I mean, I've always loved music. Like when I was eight, nine years old, yeah. if you took me to see, I finally vividly remember going to see the movie Malcolm X mm. by Spike Lee. Um, and we had to drive because I grew up in the South in America and, and Florida. So that wasn't a popular movie. Mm. And we had to drive an hour and a half to a, a major city that had enough of a minority population to show it wow. in the theater. And I remember I was so struck. I already knew the story, but I was so struck by the music which was um, the score was done by Terrence Blanchard, Mm -hmm. who's very prolific with with film scoring. And I remember how much it touched me. And I remember being a little kid, like singing all the music on the way home, like the drums and 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 the orchestra parts, like whatever I could remember. And to whoever is around me, it just sounds like I'm making noises with my mouth. (laughs) (laughs) But I just remember being so moved by that. So, um. I guess I would fast forward to when I actually started to study music mm. when I was 11 or 12 years old and learn an instrument. I started to to actually learn how to focus because mm-hmm. I did not have that skill before music. I could not focus on anything. Okay. Any Everything for me was very short attention span, unless I was building a city out of Legos. I could do that <laughs> for hours. But other other than that, Um, I didn't really have, my spirit didn't have a focus. Mm. Um, And when I would play music, it would, it would just, I would do it for hours. Like my parents would have to make me stop at night. Um, I would get to school early and go to the band room and practice Mm. and just play with my other friends. And so it, it, that's kind of where my spiritual journey really began um, outside of like religion was with music. And it was you know, it's amazing how w- as we grow older, we have kind of filters. Yeah. We, we put all these filters in, like, we want to hear what's popular. We want to hear, um, you know, what, what we think we need to know to be hip or be interested mm. in. When I was 11 years old, I wanted to hear everything. <laughs> and it didn't matter to me if it was popular. It didn't matter to me, um, you know, who it was necessarily. I just, I really connected to mm. high vibrations things mm-hmm. like a love supreme yeah. and I'm 12 so I don't <laughs> you know not very advanced spiritually but my spirit was advanced if yes. that makes any sense it makes all the sense so for me when I make music or play music it's all about reaching a level where what's being transmitted to the listener is spiritual mm. that that it touches you on some spiritual level and 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 inspires you to think deeper or to feel deeper yeah. you know one or the other or both if I'm so lucky yeah <laughs> um I I am so moved by what you're saying around your the spirit and how it shows up in your um practice now and how you were sort of figuring out that journey as a as a child 
Um, and just, yeah, I, I think in terms of the conversation around Afrofuturism, it's important to think about how spirituality is part of that like transformational yeah. new world that we're trying to build, right? That there can be this disconnect when we think about science and technology and right. some of the, the or, structures. Or a connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the science of death yeah. is something that interests yeah, yeah. me very much. It's okay. something that, that in, in Kemet they were very much aware of. They built entire pyramids about how to die, mm. you know, the people that had wealth. But this was information that typically was only accessible to the wealthy until the internet came along. Right, which right, That right. kind of gave everybody fair, fair play. Um, so, yeah, I mean, f one of the main things about music like this and about my spiritual journey with music is that it is removed and absent from the Western mindset mm -hmm. or a colonial mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's returning to the, my, uh, the origins of spirituality, which stem out of Africa. Mm -hmm. So for me, it begins that journey of looking back, which right. we call Sankofa, to understand how to move forward yes. without institutions or, or the, the, the thought process and even the harmonic and rhythmic process mm -hmm. that's been somewhat forced on us in the Western world. Yes. <laughs> All right. Wow. Nobody's mad, and we're, right? We're like, oh, how okay. many minutes into this? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yes, I hope folks brought they have their notes apps open and they're they're jotting down this um, the vibrations that are coming from the stage. Well, you had mentioned um, Kemet, and so I yeah. I thought, okay, well we've got uh, Sons of Kemet here. It's a dope album. Um, so we've got this record. Yeah. And we're going to play the track My Queen is Harriet Tubman. Okay. Which is a, a nice groove. So. Yeah, I like, wow. I like this record. I like this record. <laughs> I've heard this one. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I love so much about this record, right, is that it's called My Queen is Harriet Tubman. And then it's such a joyful mm. and, you know, high energy yeah. piece, right? Like we often associate or think about, a, a, you know, a figure like Harriet Tubman with some kind of gravity, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, a gravitas to thinking yeah. about this iconic figure. But what I love about this is that it infuses or it, it creates the space for joy, that mm -hmm. joy has to be a part of our radical black expression or a yeah. part of our, you know, Afrofuturist visioning. It has to be filled with happiness and pleasure and yeah. dancing and, you know, all of those things that are, um, can get lost when we think about what the work looks like. So, it's yeah. A, it's a rec uh, reclamation of... Uh of the narrative. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a, um, a work by an author named Jaina Brown, and in that text she talks about, she thinks about you know, these iconic figures like um, Alice Coltrane, but also Sojourner Truth. And in particular with Sojourner Truth, she talks about her as a, a figure who had her own sexuality, who was, you know, in, in trysts with folks and was living her best life, you know, was, was invested in, of course, the struggle, but also was a full person who had a full kind of um, relationship with herself and her body. So I wondered if you could talk about joy in your work and like, where that comes from, what that sounds like for you, where you position it within the things that you want to do artistically. Yeah, how yeah. do you think about joy? Um, well, I try to be joyous, first of all. That's <laughs> Just important. generally. And um, I mean, I feel like it's important, especially with the narrative of, of the African diaspora, mm -hmm. to include joy and pleasure and positive sexuality mm -hmm. and and things like that in the music yeah. because it's a huge part of our life. You know, slavery is a small piece of the diaspora history, a yes. very small piece, yeah. unfortunate, but small. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important to tell more of the narrative mm -hmm. outside of that, um, which is, you know, not always a popular thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in like Hollywood and things like that mm. or in rap music, etc. Mm. But um, you know, I purposely try to make joyous songs on the latest album uh Love Quantum. Mm -hmm. There was a song with that featured Tedra Moses, who's a great R&B singer and it's called Love Thyself. And it's literally about having love for yourself and being happy about it. 
<laughs> and things like that. So sometimes it can be very literal in that sense, but it's also about, you know, resonating with, with certain tones and vibrations and chord structures and keys and melodies that sound happy to me and trying to share that with, with everybody that's listening. So I feel like, yeah, that's the most that I know about being joyous. <laughs> yeah, and and I think back to what you were saying about being a kid, mm -hmm. right? That like this kind oh, of yeah. pure relationship with, I, I remember uh, my husband and I, we went to the birthday party for a friend of ours, her, her son turned one. So, you know, it's really a birthday party for the adults to yeah. hang out. <laughs> right. Um, so we were there and there were all these kids playing and it was so fascinating watching them because they were playing so intensely. So hard. Yeah. You know, they were playing like it was their job, like their yeah. lives depended on it. Like yeah. they were running, their faces were focused. And it was like, wow, what if we approached play in that way still? Yeah. Like with that level of intensity that this is, you know, um, you know, a life or death. You know, that that's on the line when we, we choose to engage with play or we step away from it, you right. know. And, and so it, it reminds me and makes me think back to how you your spiritual connection with music came through your, your yeah, identity super, as a kid. It was super playful. I mean, you have to you have to understand, too, and you may or may not understand, but we'll talk about it in, in America young black people especially black men are forced to grow up very quickly yes um you could get you know you could lose your life getting a candy bar and a soda in your neighborhood in a in a neighborhood where your parents own the house mm. <laughs> you know as we've seen happen so it's so it's important to give your inner child permission to be present when you play music or I'm speaking for myself, when I play music, I'm really trying to tap in to that super excited 12-year-old that just wanted to play music all day. Yeah. And um, if I don't have that energy, I will go do something else. Mm. I won't participate in the music. I will never do it if I have to do it. Yeah. My inner child needs to be present. And before I go on the stage, I welcome, you know, through meditations and through thoughts, I welcome my playfulness and my inner child to, to step in and take over so that I can spread some joy with this yeah. music. Yeah, I love that. Even the, the sense that, you know, in order to show up, joy has to be part of the experience and yes. expression. And when we think about, you know, the, the radical work of changing society, a lot of it's difficult work, yeah. but we have to find ways to nourish that part of ourselves right. or we're not going to be able to show up. And I think we're seeing that across the world with the great resignation and folks yep. reclaiming that space and that time and saying, no, I'm not going to spend 12 hours of the day doing something that makes me have no joy, that doesn't fill that that yeah. cup in, in any capacity. Um, so I think you're you're tapping into something really important when talking about um, the importance, like the vital importance of joy for you to even show up, right? Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate that my, my family encouraged me to pursue a uh, life in the arts. And they, you know, put that in front of the fear of will I make enough money or will I be able to support myself? So that fear was never really brought into the conversation. And I have friends who, you know, what time is it? Yeah, they're just now getting their doctorate or whatever. No offense, but they're, they're MD or medical doctor or their law degree, you know, what their parents kind of made them do. And they had to yeah. abandon their musical talent. Um, and they were as talented as me when we started. Mm. And just the mindset that, you know, how would they support themselves? How will they make it? It's all I've ever done is play music and work mm. in the music industry. And I'm well off you know, more well off than most people with nine to fives. Mm -hmm. And I get to wake up every day and do what I want to do and what I love to do and what I feel like doing within that realm. Mm -hmm. And my parents, that was one of their goals wow. in raising my brother and I is that we would essentially be free in the workplace to, to do as we please. Hmm. and be happy with it and be joyous so it's never i never wake up like oh, i gotta go make music today <laughs> <laughs> you know not that it's easy yeah, yeah. not that it's easy but um you know i was raised that way so i don't know any other way to live if you yeah. put me behind a desk i don't think there's a 
an amount of money that would make me happy mm -hmm. unless I was behind a desk doing something musical. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's happened on that tiny but, desk. But yeah, I don't even think I could behave in the workplace like that. Like I'm yeah. too creative. It would have to be an extremely creative job mm -hmm. to keep me focused and interested. But again, I was raised that way, therefore... I live that way, yeah. And I try to live creatively. Every mm. every day is a is um, a set of problems that can only be solved creatively. And that's actually something Wayne Shorter told me one time, hmm. uh, unsolicited. I was sitting next to him. This was in 2014, and we were in Osaka for hmm. International Jazz Day, and we were performing at the Osaka Castle. And Wayne Shorter, I just sat next to him backstage just because I wanted to feel his aura. It was so deep. Just We were like maybe a, a foot apart at the most. Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting there, and he leaned over to me. He said, do you know how they'll solve the future problems of the world? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, my God, Wayne Shorter's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what a I, question. Yeah, I was like, I, was like I, I don't have an answer to that. He said, with creativity. Hmm. with creativity. So the all problems are solved through creativity. Yeah. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that, Jim. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and snaps for your parents. Let's go. Like, yeah, let's, please. Let's, please. They did incredible it. Incredible. <laughs> to embolden you and, and your, your brother, sounds like, with yeah. this um, moving from a place of joy and um, a place of curiosity rather mm -hmm. than a place of fear. Exactly. I never had the fear to not make it in my mm -hmm. career. And I think because of that, that's why I'm successful. I mm -hmm. think it's, you know, a, apart from all the hard work and focus and all of that, literally my spirit never said, nah, I don't think this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And there were times where I had to sleep on people's couches yeah, yeah. and eat ramen noodles, which mm -hmm. I cannot stand the smell or taste of now mm -hmm. because of that, in order to get to a place where I don't have to look before I feed myself, mm -hmm. you know? And that's because, you know, when I tell other people, oh, what can I do? Because it's hard. I'm like, I don't know. If you think it's hard or not possible, you're not going to make it. Wow. The, it's that yeah. simple. The radical importance of the imagination, exactly. right? That this tool is, <laughs> is actually everything is living within this yeah. space. Your imagination is the gateway to manifesting the life or experience you want in this dimension. Mm. Mm. Okay. I imagine this, therefore we are here. All right. <laughs> We're sitting in your brain right now. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go over here. Um, so next up, we are mm. shifting gears. I don't know if y'all are ready over for this. Over to the mighty. <laughs> Let's go. Mad villainy. There is so much to unpack in so there. So much. <laughs> <laughs> my brain is trying to, I have a list. My brain is trying to, like, all the phrases that he said. Oh, man. Yes. So I love that track in particular, yeah. you know, for this conversation about Afrofuturism and um, specifically the way that Mad Lib, um, who's the producer for the, the beats on this iconic project, um, how he sort of loops in explicitly his relationship to Sun Ra and mm -hmm. um, is explicitly drawing actually from Sun Ra's work. So this, this track um, called um, Shadows of Tomorrow pulls from a Sun Ra song called, sorry, I have my notes, I'm a professor, so I'm like, okay, I gotta make sure. Let's go. <laughs> Shadows cast by tomorrow. Mm. Um, and so he's in relationship with this sort of iconic figure who um, imagines himself to be an alien and um, wants to produce a track that when you actually listen to it, he's not rhyming in the way that you think about rhyme traditionally in, in hip hop right. music. Like this is very much a poem, like a poetic text over a hip hop beat. And I just think there's so much value in thinking about how he kind of pulls apart the form and um, how he plays with time and temporality. He even has his alter ego, Quasimodo, which is yeah. the higher pitched yeah. version of him at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just really love this track and wanted to think a little bit about, A, your relationship with hip-hop, how hip-hop music has informed your artistry, um, but then also if you could just, you know, talk a little bit about, um, you know, thinking about sampling or the space mm. where, like, other artists' work finds its way into your work. Like, oh, wow. how do you think about looping the legacies of others into right. the work that you're making, either explicitly or, you know, in a way that's only known to you? Okay. Ooh, where to start? <laughs> um, 
Okay, well, to me, uh, I like to speak factually. So factually speaking, if you connect the dots, hip-hop is the verbal component of bebop. Kendrick Lamar is Charlie Parker. Yes. Like, this is painfully obvious to me. <laughs> Painfully obvious that that hip hop and and wordsmithing is literally the vocal component of bebop. It is the continuation of the language in that vocabulary, not only in the phrasing but also in the message of it. And um, this, I mean, just specific spe spe blah, blah, blah. trumpet mouth specifically <laughs> with with the track you played. I mean, he said the light of today is the future of future light of tomorrow. So, like, there's so much going on there. Like, first of all, uh, there is, you know, time is a construct. It's not really real. It's something we've all agreed to, like money, to operate under. The sun goes up and goes down, always has and always will since the beginning in time until the end of time, which none of us will be present for. So how can there really be a time? And I think that's a lot of what they're alluding to. Uh, another aspect of it, before my brain forgets, is that light Actual light is multidimensional, so is sound. So these are two elements that can go from a third dimension to a fourth dimension to a fifth dimension to a twelfth dimension. Um, so literally, one concept of this third dimension that we're in is simply light reflecting off of things that create the matter that we see and understand. The way you see the color red is not the way I see the color red. The way you just heard those vibrations is not the way I hear them. Like this is all just a manifestation of light and sound, which travels interdimensionally. Hmm. Woo, y'all still with me? Okay. <laughs> y'all still with me? So, I mean, to me, immediately, that's what they're alluding to right away. They're letting you know that sound and light are multidimensional and that they're, they're once again, constructs of your manifestation. Um, they're talking about the fact that time is a construct. So the future is now, now is the future. The light that you have now is the light of the future that came from the past, so the past and future are non-existent. It's actually only the present is all you can live in. Anything else you try to think about the past, you weren't there, or, or it's already past. Anything you try to think about the future is just left up to your own, uh, your own uh, anxiety that you will start to create around a situa situation that does not exist and cannot exist until it's right in front of you. Wow. Y'all still with me? Yeah, we're still here. Okay, we're still cool. here, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, so now when it gets to sampling, yeah. uh, I, love, I love the idea of sampling. I love the continuation of it. I think it was, again, a way, uh, especially in America mm -hmm. and for hip-hop and um, rap music, it was a way to reclaim the narrative once again yeah. uh, from bebop and, and uh, from the world they call jazz. Um, and it was a it was a way to reclaim it and move it move it forward and and return it to the community because once you once you know when all the prolific black artists like Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, mm. Miles Davis, at some point in time the music they do becomes gentrified yes. and gets categorized and then becomes a institutional piece for people to study and then imitate and build a life around. So when hip hop came along, it was the return of enlightenment mm -hmm. for the community mm -hmm. that it was a part of. That that music was serving the community that it was coming out of in the Bronx and in Queens. And it was giving people a platform to to bring their community together under common knowledge and common struggle and share information. Like metaphysically, mm -hmm. if you break down all those lyrics, that's a whole lesson in metaphysics right there. Mm. in that little four minute track yeah. um, so that that's really the purpose of it which is why it's a continuation yeah. of bebop and um, for me it, without sampling we wouldn't we wouldn't have had that because mm -hmm. cats were just looping records and spitting over them yeah. um, and to me it's, it's amazing it's necessary and yeah. I'm not talking about the commercial component of hip hop once again that's the gentrification of it mm -hmm. and that's the you know making it pop and talking about silly stuff mm -hmm. uh, which they have to do to help you know, uh, uh, let me just say the greatest, the greatest way to, to, to distract somebody from, from truthful information is with misinformation. Mm. So for every truth, you're going to find nine untruths mm. uh, in order to distract you and confuse you from it. So 
we are, we are always going to deal with that yeah. in music, especially intellectual music like this. So yeah. for me, I don't sample a lot because it's expensive. It is. Yeah, real and talk. It, and it should be. It should be. And, and more importantly, um, you know, every record I, I buy, I, I own all my masters and mm. I own all my publishing and I always have. Thank you to Donald Byrd and Dr. Wendell Logan. Mm. Um, I, sorry, Dr. Donald Byrd. All he was right. a doctor. Um, <laughs> so for me, when it comes to sampling, I don't want to sample something that the artist didn't own anyway, mm. that they had robbed from them and taken from them. So if the if if I do want to sample something and the artist doesn't own the publishing and doesn't own the master, I don't sample it mm. because I don't want to just pay a bunch of record execs and their grandkids yeah. for what they stole from somebody. <laughs> if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if somebody owns their master, I'm I'm down to sample it. Yeah, and I mean, I, there's so much in what you just said. <laughs> it's uh, like uh, my my like my rapper brain, my professor brain. They're all like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what to respond to first? But just on your point about bebop, you know, in, in Rakim re recently or not relatively recently um, published like an autobiography, um, and for folks who are not aware of Rakim, his he, he kind of engineers this God flow in the early 90s, late and 1980s, where he is radically revising people's relationship to bars and to meter. Mm -hmm. And he really, I mean, the flows that we hear today, these kind of like pyrotechnic, <laughs> incredible, you know, temporal experiments that we hear over a beat, many folks kind of trace back that relationship to more dynamic flows with Rakim. And when he talks about what inspired him to flow in different ways, he directly cites like Miles Davis and listening Absolutely. to these artists and what they were doing instrumentally and trying to do the same thing with his voice. So yeah, it's a continuation of that vocabulary. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then with what you're saying about, um, you know, sampling, I think it's a really powerful conversation around how, you know, hip hop artists in part what they're doing or producers what they're doing is pulling from the thing, but you, you know, you, you don't ever want to be in danger of biting something, right? So like, how do you make it your own? How do you take that as inspiration and create something that speaks to you and from your perspective, right? So it's about paying homage and reaching back and saying, okay, this is the history from which this thing comes from and educating folks, right? How many times have you listened to a song and been like, what is that sample? Right. And walked back <laughs> and found the original track exactly. or thought, wow, how did this person hear this track and know how to do this, right? right. And kind of made you listen to the original piece differently. So there's some really interesting kind of education, like historical work that's mm -hmm. going on within sampling. I mean, it's, it's also important too, just to, just to add to that, yeah, yeah. because a lot of times when, when things, you know, historic things that were sent or tracks that we know that were built off of samples, it's almost like, a, again, reclaiming the narrative. Mm -hmm. So returning something that everybody knows to the forefront, be like, man, we all know this, and now there's, a, there's more information on it. Yeah. There's a, an added layer of information to something we already knew. So that, yes. that familiar, familiarity with the original yeah. you know, brings a whole other level of, oh, okay, it goes like that. Yeah. You know, now, now it has Kendrick on it, you know, spitting metaphysics to you, yes. you know, on this sample that you already love. Yeah. So that's, to me, it's a beautiful thing. It's like what you were saying with this kind of multidimensionality, right? That right. you can now access different layers. Yes. You can now actually tap into other registers of the song because you've been given access by this reinterpretation right. um, from another artist who has a, the, an entirely different experience. Um, before I, I switch over the track, I wanted to ask a little bit about... How you think about your, it sounds like, I, I feel like I know what the response is going to be, but I don't know, your artist self and your kind of like everyday life self. It sounds like there may not be a split between these two, um, but I think a lot about MF Doom and the mm. mask yeah. and the importance of the mask for this artist um, in terms of forcing people to engage with the sound and the stories mm -hmm. and the materiality of his voice and not having an artist to fixate on, right? Like he's responding to visual culture and right. the emergence of the MC and the artist as the primary access point. 
and the music itself receding to the backdrop, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's actually being said or heard. Right. And so having this mask that doesn't allow us to access this artist creates a space in which you're having to interface with the mythology he's creating, with the, um, with the, the, the kind of characters that he's built, the world that he's building, right, in a very distinct way. So I wondered how alter ego might show up in your work, if it's you who's always the one who's kind of putting forth the work, if you think about that person as someone distinct, is that person someone you have to like access, you know, in your like regular, regular life? Are you always the same way as you are when you're a performer? Like, how does that show up for you? Um, for, for me, you know, I've always, I've always, there is an alter ego in me that is dying to get out. He's just not out yet. <laughs> he's not out yet. And um, he's coming. It's coming. It's certainly coming, but it's not ready for the public. Um, so the artist that you see is, is also the person that you see for now. Um, but there's definitely some, some things I want to move into and some topics I want to deal with and um, directions I want to take that will require an alter ego and a split from the person that I am now. Uh, because I feel like the person I am now, the artist I am now, is on a journey that I want to continue. Um, and I don't want to confuse the two narratives. Uh, but there, there is another narrative that wants to come out and wants to be present, and it's um, probably not as easy to digest. Therefore, <laughs> an alter ego would be very appropriate for it. <laughs> I need you to talk a little bit more about this. I mean, we're, we're all that. like, okay, tell, tell us more. Give us something. Well, I mean, I, last year I started rapping. Um, I worked a lot with Wyclef Jean during the, the pandemic, and he encouraged me to do so, right down to the point of um, we performed on the Late Show or the Tonight Show. I'm not sure which one it, it was because I, I, I don't know but the Stephen Colbert Late Show or Tonight Show on CBS. And I think it was the day before I was in the rehearsal and I was, we were rehearsing the song just before he showed up and I was doing his part. And when he came in, he said, okay, so you're going to do this verse. I was like, on TV? It was like, I have no experience rapping other than, you know, foolishness, uh, you know, um, in a rehearsal. He says, no, 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 you know all the lyrics, you have a flow. We've been talking about this, you need to do this. Um, and I've helped him. I've been, I've helped him write things on his next record and produce things on his next record. And through that process, he shared with me um, how to create rhyme schemes and how to create the scheme for the song and how to make the references to the you know movie reference, uh, um, um, culture reference, et cetera, et cetera, wordplay. And um, it's all being worked out right now, and some of that is present in what I do now, but it's not an alter ego. It's still, it's still Theo talking. Um, the, the messages that I really want to deal with um, you know, are more reflective on what's going on in the world, what's going on in, with the culture, um, and those things I feel like an alter ego is necessary because I want that separated from who I am as a person and who I am as an artist and what I've already established as an artist. I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the music I've created and the space I've created is a safe space for everyone to come to and participate in with this music and not feel like you'll be bombarded with with everything, I want it to be uh, an escape from the world that's going on now. Um, with my alter ego, it's not gonna be that way. It's gonna be directly, this is, this is what it is. This is how I see it and unapologetic. So I'm just still working out in my brain how and when to do that. Yeah, wow. <laughs> well, I'm excited to hear about this part of your journey because I think, you know, sometimes as listeners, as fans, we don't always have access to that kind of inner dialogue that's happening with an artist when they're realizing, maybe I need a different container for this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and the process of coming into that, of saying, okay, this person inside of me is kind of their... their um, like, you know, cells will, like, differentiate from each other, right? Yeah. Like, they're start, it's starting to... I mean, to it's, it's already started. If, yeah. if, if you're familiar with any of my work, the Black to Life of Future Past came out of, out of me taking months off from music and, and, and self-prescribing uh, self 
self-prescribing uh, psychedelic mushrooms, psy- psilocybin uh, mushrooms in my home, you know, in my ancestral home in Florida uh, by myself in modes of, in days and weeks of meditation and self-reflection, looking in the mirror and asking myself the hard questions that we, we have to ask ourselves and pointing out my own flaws and my own spiritual inadequacies and finding solutions to them myself. So it was, at this point I realized there is a, there is another, there is another, uh, 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 identity that wants to, mm. to take the stage and I said okay but but this is not fully developed and I cannot just go left because yeah. I don't want to lose you I want you to come with me on the journey or I want you to choose which which journey you want to take with me yeah. so that album was me realizing that I um was going to be the hero of my own story. Hmm. That's what that album is about, uh, here, uh, future past. Hmm. Um, and yeah. then I moved into Love Quantum. And the first thing you listen when you open, the, the opening of Love Quantum is me proclaiming and, that jazz is dead hmm. and explaining why, hmm. explaining why I'm killing jazz. Hmm. And um, this is the beginning of my alter ego, these two albums. So yeah. there's more to come. And yeah. I will. I think after <laughs> the next album that will come out next year, it will be clear that there is an alter ego there. Wow. And it's kind of really going to explore the, um, the struggle between the two, you yeah. know, and how one's fighting to get out. So that will be relevant and uh, present. And um, after that, you're, there's going to be another artist present <laughs> wow. and um not not that i'll abandon this one at all don't worry we'll, i will still do what i do uh as the trumpet player and all of those kind of things and yeah. composer but there there's much more i want to explore in music that um that uh will will happen yeah that's all i, I know how yeah, to say yeah, yeah. about it because it's so it's just incubating inside of me mm-hmm right now but it's it's coming that's that's fire <laughs> and we contain multitudes so i love yeah. the idea of the alter ego to me is such a powerful one because yeah, it, absolutely it um you know it reflects our infinite ability to regenerate to yeah. change to grow and, and um, to explore our uh, to explore our extremities yeah yeah the, the extreme parts of our personality that you that you have to keep in check yeah. In other arenas, uh, I want to I want to explore not doing that. Yeah. And the, the space, <laughs> I think, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, like the space of play, yes. you know, like especially I can imagine for an artist who is, you know, as seasoned as yourself, that there can start to be constraints around what you feel like you're, you know, like you're responding to a version of yourself that folks have a relationship with. And so it can be difficult it can somewhat. I, I, I've been lucky and fortunate yeah. that my whole career, or at least recording career, because I had a whole life in Asia before I returned to the mm-hmm. West. That's not on record. Okay. And that's not on tape, and nobody knows anything about but people that were there um, that led me to the person you see now. Mm-hmm. But my music is always every record's a different thing. Okay. It's another layer of the onion, and that will always be the yeah. case. So I've never. I've never felt the pressure of, hey, this really worked. Will you do that again? Yeah. And yeah, nobody yeah. in my label camp, luckily I own my master's, so I have a lot of power That's when great. we negotiate, okay. um, has even hinted that I should do something again. Good. Or that I should focus on something that resonated extremely well. Mm. It's more so they know that when I bring in the next record, it's going to be another adventure that we have to yeah. unpack. And yeah, unfold. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've I've okay. always avoided those kind of restraints, um, and 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 me expressing jazz is dead was a big part of that. Mm. You know, I own my masters, uh, I I own my publishing, uh, I get paid for what I do mm-hmm. handsomely. Mm-hmm. Uh, therefore, the narrative of being a jazz musician that's taking advantage of underpaid has mm-hmm. to show up in a suit and tie, can't wear jewelry, doesn't wear sneakers, isn't hip or cool, is no longer grunge or punk to mm-hmm. me, is dead. Mm-hmm. That's, that's gone. We have Robert Glasper. We have Kamasi Washington. We have Terrace Martin. We have Shabaka Hutchins and the Sons of Kemet. We have myself. And, and we're not 
aligning with that dead narrative anymore. Yes. Um, and we control the culture. We dictate the culture, not mm. the labels, not the industry, not the legacy of what they have decided to call jazz, which was uh, rebuked by Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, mm. Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Charles Mingus, Doc Cheatham. Mm. They, this is a word and a, and a, and a, um, a practice that they did not agree with. Mm. But now that they're all passed, it's okay uh, to put their name on, on the face of it and say this is jazz. Yeah. But they're not even here to speak for themselves anymore. Mm. You know? Yes, and you're d directly <laughs> confronting that. So yes, absolutely. I, jazz wow. is dead. So I wanted to, I mean, we could, any of these conversations are like three hour, four hour, five year, <laughs> five <laughs> decade conversations. Right. So it's hard for me to, to move. But I wanted to play a track that I actually pretty recently came upon. Um, it's called um, Temple of the Mental uh, featuring Killer Priest from a band called Material. Um, and it's a, an interesting narrative track where there's a, a kind of story that's being told. So I wanted to play just to think about how narrative shows up in your work. Awesome. There, there's some, there's some bars in there. <laughs> there's some metaphys metaphysical science of death in there. Yeah. He said, uh, terrestrial escape through the East Gate. Mm -hmm. And uh, terrestrial means living on the surface of the planet. Mm. Interterrestrial means inside of the planet. Extraterrestrial means outside of the surface. Mm. And and um, part of the science of death that I've studied in in the books of the dead, the Tibetan book of the dead, the Abyssinian book of the dead, the funeral text and things like that, talk about um, when your body dies, uh, the three day chemical composition that takes place. Jesus, the story of Jesus. Um, mm. um, with the, the, the wine and the bread, the yeast, the chemical compound, essentially, mm -hmm. how your DNA transforms and when your God DNA takes over, which is millions of years old, um, it has to travel west on eastern winds to reach the cusp of the earth where the, I'm sorry, the cusp of the magnetosphere, which is the shield around the earth mm -hmm. in order to escape into space or the heavens. Um, and this happens is an occurrence we call the aurora borealis, mm. which is the northern lights. So that my man said that he he said yeah. terrestrial escape through the east gate. Yeah, which is exactly what that means. Mm. If I know my funeral text, no, that is. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. There <laughs> so was I mean, another was, line. There was so much in there. It I, was, I had never heard this. This is deep. Uh, yeah, I I have recently come across this and I, I sat and listened to it for like five hours on a loop just like can I catch everything There's and I couldn't <laughs> um he said bacteria become superior in thinking about this kind of this like, is the, your how your DNA transforms and leads you to your the next stage of of life where you're you're no longer a physical compound yes and can you talk about that the the transcendence or moving beyond the body within your work or within your artistry, how you think about that, to, to come back to the, the body space and almost <laughs> the, like the limitations of the body, um, oh. but just how, yeah, it, it, it sounds like you're just through the relationship you have with this, this track and some of the other things that you've, yeah. you've brought up that you're thinking about how to like expand even beyond these kind of like earthly constraints. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't necessarily want to return when I die this time. I want to see what else is out there. And and I believe all of this is encoded in, in our DNA. Um, again, you know, the trans the transformation of bacteria is a part of, you know, it's a part of some religions. You know, it's the wine and the and the yeast and the bread is bacteria, literally. Bread is bacteria and wine is fermented, that's bacteria and, and you know, the metaphysical messages that that represents and things like that. So it's, for me, it's really, <laughs> I'm, I'm in this life and I'm in this body and I love it, but I feel like a, we are all divine spirits having human experiences. I, should I say that again? I think so. We I are think all we're still divine marinating on beings that. Having, hu having human experiences. And the, the things about the science of death and, and bacterial transformations, we all have access to and is locked in all of our DNAs. Mm. And, and he's simply reminding us of that, 
reminding us of that, that that is the, the great journey that we're all on. And I think I came to terms with that during the pandemic mm. when I was really studying these texts. I really came to terms with the, the science of death and the art of it and how it is the gateway to life. Hmm. literally, in that a soul has no expiration date or beginning date. It always has existed. We're all made from the same matter and creation. Uh, I don't want to say creator because I don't want to humanize it hmm. or, 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 or put it into a category because I believe it's beyond comprehension yeah. uh, of the human mind. But our soul, the, the subconscious that exists in all of us, is totally aware of all of this totally aware of all of this um and uh yeah i'll leave that at that yeah there's i mean so much packed into that that um kind of you know philosophy and a, a lot of um you know black thinkers radical black thinkers talk about sort of like vibrational ontologies or things that mm -hmm. are pre yes. you know that it, that are even outside of the realm of the body right that are right. things that we can't sort of explain or explicate or unpack and right but you can feel when Alice Coltrane plays exactly and we all <laughs> are experiencing this and i think something that you're you're calling attention to is also the the relationship that we all relationship and perhaps responsibility that we have to each other right yeah. All, we're made of the same material. We're we're star stuff. We're star you know? literally. <laughs> and so we are a, star people. All yeah. of us. All of us, literally. And yeah. and you know when you when we leave the physical realm, uh, we're all returning to the same source, mm -hmm. no matter how we identify with it or choose to identify with it. Because I don't think the source judges us on that. Mm. So we're, we're all a part of that same source. We're all on that same journey. Um, and we're all a part of that same energy, which is infinite and, and uh, never beginning or ending once again. Yes. So it's important for us as on a human level, if we could all understand this, the world would have so much more beauty in it and so much more peace and so much more happiness and yeah. <laughs> for everybody yeah you know yeah um so it's it's important and for me my work is a part of that it's 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 i'm experiencing that and i'm understanding that therefore i'm sharing that with the mm -hmm. vibrations mm -hmm. i am looking to create the 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 highest vibrations i can yeah. to share with people so that they can be inspired to vibrate themselves higher yeah not understand my not you know join my vibration raise your own vibrations mm -hmm. that's the whole point Yes. And I think about the line from here where he just he just says peace and quiet <laughs> and thinking about like what what that really means, what it really means to inhabit a space of peace and what you're talking about with um, recognizing that we are interdependent, recognizing mm -hmm. that we're in relationship to each other. And we're we're just about out of time. I knew this was going to happen. We have like 50 million records that we got oh, through yeah. like what, four of like five songs. Yeah, that's normal. <laughs> um, which is a. a I think a testament to like the the thought that you brought into this space and but there the, was such the a thread the between works. everything that that you played. Yeah, there was such a common thread, and it it yeah. almost it's like what we talked about in the beginning. He literally just laid it all out on that. <laughs> you yeah. know? so that process was was crazy. It yeah, was a beautiful thread. Yeah, I I wanted to to conclude just by asking if you could talk a little bit about your process of working with other artists, being a collaborator, thinking about like interdependence and how we yeah. speak to each other and we're gonna see you in a moment <laughs> I mean, um, doing some of that work. So yeah. For, for me, collaborating with other artists has always been, has been about um, just vibrations that align. It's never been a forced thing. Um, it's never been, you know, based off of marketing or popularity, it's always just been like, man, these vibrations are really correct and really resonate with me. And um, and when I would approach them or cross paths with them, with them, they would feel the same way. It would be reciprocal, and what we would create would come out of that relationship, the exploration of that that ex that relationship and that common ground between um, our vibrations. Wow, the final word. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you for, so much for this. This has been a fabulous conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's all her. What a. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> <laughs>
an exploration of like metaphysics and philosophy, black radical thought, art, music, life, death, transformation. It was all contained within this conversation and the vibrations emanating from this. Um, this amazing technology. So thank you for joining us. I'm very excited to see Theo Kroger. Uh, what time is the concert? It's 8.30. 8.30, okay, 8:30. so stay tuned, hang out, and we'll see you there. The mothership leaves at 8.30. <laughs> right, be on time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>